Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the 2022 Salem Athenaeum Adopt a Book Conservation Evening. I'm Jean Marie Procious, Executive Director, and I will be your host and presenter tonight. First, we would like to acknowledge the donors who have adopted items in the collection for conservation in the past. Right now, we will run a short video of the items that were conserved in 2020 along in 2020, <laughs> along with the names of the sponsors. The book plates shown will be pasted into the volumes as a lasting tribute. Small plaques will be placed next to the plaster bus. While this runs, I will provide a brief introduction about the Athenaeum Collections and the Adopt-A-Book program. The Social Library was founded in 1760 as Salem's first library. New members donated items from their personal collections to form the core of the new library. The trustees recruited Reverend Jeremy Condy to act on their behalf during his trip to London, and he purchased several crates of both new and used books. He also established purchasing relationships with several London booksellers so that purchasing lists could later be sent by mail. Books were nearly impossible to collect during the revolution and the library languished. Member Samuel Kerwin moved to London from 1775 to 1784 to escape harassment for his loyalist sympathies. While there, he copiously collected for the social library, although the volumes were not available to the members until after his return in 1784. In 1781, the Philosophical Library was founded with the scientific collection of chemist Richard Kerwin. It was captured as a privateering prize and auctioned off on the docks in Salem. This new library collected scientific, mathematical, and technical books and periodicals. Nathaniel Bowditch was invited to use the collections without being a shareholder. In 1810, the Social Library and the Philosophical Library merged to become the Salem Athenaeum. Several of the items up for adoption tonight would have been part of those earlier predecessor libraries. Others were purchased directly or donated. At the time of the merger, several members donated large collections of titles on desirable topics in exchange for shares in the new and improved library. This should give you an idea about how we came to have these titles and thousands more that are on the shelves. The Athenaeum has always collected for the interests of the members, which is how we have gathered a library on such a broad range of topics. The Adopt-A-Book Conservation Program was started in 2012 by the Collections Committee, which was then led by Stephen Clark, who remains a supporter. Today, the committee is chaired by Trustee Marla Gearhart, and I would like to thank Marla and all the members of the committee who contribute so much to adopt -a book exhibits and general collections care. Elaine Von Bruns, Sharon Corrigan, Nancy Ryan, Gus Souza, and Donna Albino. Thank you. Adoption involves directly supporting the conservation of an individual item. Because the cost is often significant, we split the total amount for each item into shares. Donors may either give the cost of a single share multiple shares or the entire cost for one item. This year for the first time, adoption is available online and open ahead of the program. The pandemic changes everything. Carolyn will share the link in the chat so you can see which shares are remaining. It will also be available on our website until all the shares are sponsored. If you have questions, please put them in the chat feature as they occur to you. And I will try to answer as we go, if it's quick or we'll save it to the end if it's more involved. And now I will start a slideshow with the 2022 Adopt-A-Book candidates. So bear with me for one second. Carolyn, do we see it? Great. So normally I arrange the books alphabetically by author. That's what we do in library land. But tonight I wanted to start with the earliest book of the batch. And that is Francis Bacon's last work, Silva Silvarum. The title in English means a miscellany of topics. It was published posthumously by his secretary, Dr. William Rowley, shortly after Bacon's death in 1626. As the title suggests, it is a miscellaneous collection of extracts from books and Bacon's own observations and experiments. Arguably the best single collection of the kind up until that time, it was repeatedly reissued reaching a 10th edition in 1676. This Photo is a stunning illustrated allegorical title page that suggests um, religious sanction of scientific enterprise. So we have God up here looking down on the scientific works. 
appended to the Silva Savarum text is the New Atlantis, an unfinished work which was written before 1617. This brief track is a description of a utopian island and its scientific community called Solomon's House. There were no women of pe or people of color on the island, which is unfortunate, but not surprising for the time. It's credited with having suggested the foundation of the Royal Society, which was founded a little bit later in 1660. In the common 17th century style, the printing is blocked in. So we have these lines here and then this margin where we have the summaries to help guide your reading and to find the place. The existing binding shown in the photo on the right is um, the boards are covered in marble paper, which is likely from the mid 19th century. So it's definitely not original. The Athenaeum copy is the second edition published in 1628 and is nearly 400 years old. It includes writing in pencil on three end sheets. There we go, the New Atlantis. Um, right here is the pencil. Now there's a title to this. It's called A Trip with the Cards and its Investigation. So that was added by a reader or a previous owner at some point in those last four centuries. And it's a card trick and explains how to do it, which is kind of fun. You never quite know what you're gonna find when you open up one of these books. Our next book is The Letters of Mrs. Adams, The Wife of John Adams. Um, it was published in 1840, so well after her death. And this is a collection of the correspondence of Abigail Adams to her husband and others, including the reproduced letter here that was to Oliver Wendell which is a nice touch. The rest of the letters are transcribed and set in type. The spine of this volume is a nice example of what we refer to as the Athenaeum binding, which is marble paper on the covers with leather corners and a spine that includes Salem Athenaeum stamped into the leather, like you see right here. Abigail's grandson, Charles Francis Adams, son of John Quincy Adams, contributed an introductory memoir of Abigail and expressed concern that the founding families should be remembered for their contributions and volumes such as this suited his purpose. Legacy was also a preoccupation of Charles Francis's son, Henry Adams, who was our next book. So there's the title page of the Abigail Adams letters. So here we have Henry. As a young man, Henry served as his father's secretary in Washington, DC, when the elder Adams served as a US representative. Henry accompanied him to London during the Civil War when he served as US minister, minister to Great Britain to ensure British neutrality, a key Northern strategy for the war. This early experience with politics shaped Henry's career as a journalist, historian, and author. The Education of Henry Adams was his final book and its principal theme was that Western civilization was in crisis in the early years of the 20th century because man's production of power was outrunning his ability to control it. New leaders trained in scientific methods were the only hope, according to Adams. Many of his opinions turned out wrong, but he was also a keen observer and documented the vast changes that occurred during his lifetime as the United States moved from a colonial society to a highly industrial one. As was the case for the prior generations of the Adams family, public service was a guiding principle. Throughout his career, he attempted to contextualize history and past events to make knowledge of them useful to the present and future generations. A biography of Henry Adams called The Last American Aristocrat, which there's on the photo here, um, was released last year by David Brown. And um, it wonderfully covers Henry's life and work and inspired me to go finding this in the stacks. And I realized that we have the first public edition from 1918 there was a privately printed short run previous to this, but um, this was published by the Massachusetts Historical Society and it's excellent to read. It's large type, comfortable to hold. And once it's repaired, it will be able to circulate. Next up is the miscellanies. Um, similar to Francis Bacon, Danes, Danes Barrington's miscellanies compiles articles on various topics, both um, 
both miscellanies are larger octavo size, as you can see here. And this one has been well read and has a lot of shelf wear as well. Among the articles are Francisco Antonio Morel's Journey of a Voyage in 1775 to explore the coast of America northward of California. So this is an expedition that is the first and only contemporary account in English of the first Spanish voyage into Alaskan waters. Also up for conservation this year is the first English record of Russian exploration into Alaska. So I have a nice mirror there. Um, we'll hear about that a little later. In Barrington, there is an account of a careful investigation of Mozart as a prodigy without his father present. Included is this engraving of the musician at the age of seven. There's also a reference to John Manwaring's book, which is the first biography of Handel, which is also up for conservation this year. And I just serendipitously found this when I was looking through the book. Um, the author explains in this passage that both Handel and Mozart kept a spinet in their bedchambers to try out ideas that occurred to them while they were in bed. Um, the author also expresses his hope that the little Mozart may possibly attain the same advanced years as Handel, contrary to the common observation that such ingenia precocia are generally short-lived, so precocious geniuses, um, which is a nice sentiment that he wished long life for Mozart, must have been impressed with his talent. Also included are the important essay on the possibility of approaching the North Pole and other natural history essays, including a treatise on whether the turkey was known before the discovery of America, and another on reindeer, bats, the cuckoo, and various botanical subjects. This slide is a genealogical chart of a Welsh family, adding um, to the true miscellaneous nature of this collection. You see that also needs repair, so that will be part of the plan to get it fixed up. And lastly, this volume has a wonderful index which is always appreciated by scholars and the librarians who assist them. Next is Richard Bradley's A Philosophical Account of the Works of Nature, which was originally published in 1721, shortly before he was appointed as the first ever chair of botany at the University of Cambridge in 1724, a position that he held for the rest of his life. It was unsalaried, however, so he earned a living from publishing. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, um, all right, so his position was unsalaried and he earned a living from publishing. Bradley was the first to publish a recipe using the then exotic pineapple. He furthered understanding in fungal spore germination and plant reproduction. He also created a unified biological theory of infectious disease. This work is an early attempt to describe and group the animal and plant kingdoms. The illustrations are very interesting and well executed, with many of them depicting live animals rather than specimens. Included are a bat and a frog. Both of these illustrations pull out to review, a review reveal additional types of bats and frogs. When that happens, there are bound to be tears from use in improper folding, which was the one to slide right here. So all these pullouts, they all get tears right there or on the folds and that will be repaired in conservation. And this is just a little pullout of the type. This is the era of the long S if you're not familiar with that. So it looks like an F, but it's actually an S. They did it in handwriting and also in type. So quite common. The Athenaeum copy is uh, the second edition printed in 1739. On to the more travel and adventure. Charlevoix, <clears throat> journey of a voyage to North America undertaken by order of the French king. 
containing the geographical description and natural history of the country, particularly Canada, together with an account of the customs, character, religions, manners, and traditions of the original inhabitants. Quite the title. Charlevoix was a French Jesuit priest, traveler, and writer, and often considered the first historian of New France. This two-volume set was bound at the same time, but one volume has seen more use and I think a leather dressing or conditioner was applied. So here you see volume one is the darker volume, volume two, the lighter. As is the case with most books, volume one gets heavier use. Um, between 1705 and 1709, as part of his Jesuit training, Charlevoix taught at the Jesuit college in Quebec, Quebec, then returned to teach in Paris, and Voltaire was one of his pupils. In 1720, he was assigned to survey the historic boundaries of Acadia, the French North American colony lost to the British in 1713. His knowledge of North America led to an extension of his assignment. He was tasked to find a route to the Pacific while giving the impression of being no more than a traveler or a missionary. All he had were two canoes, eight experienced companions and basic trading merchandise. From Quebec, he set out along the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes. He traveled along the eastern shore of Lake Michigan to the Illinois River, following it, following it until he reached the Mississippi, which he considered the finest confluence in the world. Charlevoix traveled down the Mississippi to the mouth of the Gulf Coast, at the Gulf Coast, and eventually made it back to France at the end of 1722. Charlevoix kept a record of his entire expedition, which he published, and we have here an English translation. So here is a map of his travels. Charlevoix's records of local geography were later used to improve regional maps. Even though he didn't come close to reaching the Pacific, he recommended two possible routes by the Missouri or by the establishment of a mission in Sioux territory from which contact with tribes further west may aid in the determining the route. Charlevoix, Michigan is named in his honor as well as a region near Quebec City. <clears throat> so here are, he wrote in letter form too. So part of the journal is um, collected hit letters. Oops, went too far. Here we go. William Clark, William Cox and the Russian discoveries. <clears throat> William Cox was an English historian and priest who served as tutor and traveling companion to English nobility from 1771 to 1786. His important account includes the first appearance in English of a number of narratives related to Russian America and to the early years of the fur trade. Included are translations of Bering's voyages with those of his predecessors and followers to the Aleutian or Fox Islands, which are shown here in the map. An account of their inhabitants and their language, observations on the fur trade and so on. Here, Cox defined Russian terms he uses and explains the composition of Russian names to make it easier to follow along the text. And um, <clears throat> Cox's work is considered a key source on Siberia and the far Northwest of America, documenting Russian attempts to connect with the new world. And as you can see, this volume has had some use, a lot of use with chunks of leather missing, as well as an old replacement of the spine that will now need to be done again. This is called a reback. So the original spine failed <clears throat> and it was replaced with new leather right there. And now needs to be replaced again. Next up is Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, a Russian realistic novel, just the subtitle in the American edition. Normally we wouldn't necessarily concern ourselves with conserving a decorated cloth volume in this condition. However, it is the most acclaimed novel by one of the greatest and most influential novelists of all time. And this is the first American edition published in 1886, the first issue and very rare. Um, it also has lovely, delicate end papers, which make it all the better. So as I referenced previously, this is Memoirs of the Life of the Late George Frederick Handel and by John Mainwaring, although he is not acknowledged on the title page here. He was an English parish priest and later professor, professor of divinity at Cambridge. In 1760, he anonymously published this first biography of the great Baroque composer Handel. It was the first biography of any single composer and the first published catalog of Handel's works. 
Mainwaring received much of the information about Handel's early life from J.C. Smith Jr., Handel's confidant and copyist. And as such, many details are unable to be confirmed, unfortunately. There is no question that he was recognized as musically gifted at a young age and composed complex original works by age nine. The Athenaeum copy is the first edition from 1760, the year after Handel was interred in Westminster Abbey. This volume has previously been rebacked or had the spine replaced, as I was just pointing out with Cox. You can see that the spine here, this is very obvious, that the spine is a lighter quality, a lighter color, excuse me. Um, the spine is a different color and it failed due to the poor quality of the leather that was used in the repair, more so than the skill of the craftsperson. It's quite common to use sheepskin, which is thinner and doesn't hold up as well. These items will be addressed by our conservators who will use the best materials available for the new repair. So they'll last for hundreds more years. The next book is also about Handel. This is an account of the musical performances in Westminster Abbey and the Pantheon in commemoration of Handel. The author Charles Burney was an organist and harpsichordist who composed and wrote about music, including documenting the contemporary music scene of Europe on his travels, as well as his highly regarded A General History of Music, which took him decades. He contributed nearly all of the entries about music in Reese's Cyclopedia, which was produced in serial form from 1802 to 1820 and eventually ran to 39 volumes, um, which we have here at the Acme. We have Reese's Cyclopedia. Uh, three of Bernie's daughters were writers as well, Susan, Sarah, and Fanny Bernie. Fanny was highly regarded in her lifetime and her novel of manners and satire such as Evelina influenced Jane Austen. So a very creative family. In this commemoration of Handel, Bernie celebrates the composer with a brief biography and provides exacting detail of the memorial concerts, including descriptions and illustrations of the chorus and orchestra. Here they are in Westminster Abbey. The seating arrangements of the orchestra and lists of conductors and both the instrumental and vocal performers. These are some of the vocal performers listed right there. Also included is an illustration of the Handel Memorial in Westminster Abbey. That's right here. Proceeds from the sale of this volume went to the musical fund, which helped the families of musicians who had fallen into poverty. So it was a celebration of Handel for a good cause. Charlotte Lennox. She wrote The Female Coyote or The Adventures of Arabella. It was a very popular satire and also one of the most popular books here at the Social Library Collection. Although it was published anonymously, the author's identity was an open secret. Here you can see one of our readers didn't know and wrote in ink on the flyleaf an excellent a satire. Who wrote it? Question mark. And the dedication page also had the author question mark. Uh, we now know it was Charlotte Lennox. Samuel Johnson was Lennox's mentor and is believed to have written the dedication and the penultimate chapter. The Mel Quixote is a comedy of errors that looks to the romances of centuries prior and a parody of Cervantes' epic Don Quixote. It warns of reading without context. The main character of the story, Arabella, had a solitary childhood and learned of the world through her deceased mother's book collection. When her uncle and cousins come to stay, hilarity ensues. Silliness and laugh out loud humor stems from Arabella's solitary musings on what should in her mind be happening at any given time. From the confusion of her relatives and friends who don't understand what's going on because they have no knowledge of these supposedly famous historic figures that Arabella keeps talking about. And humor also arises from Arabella running away or thinking she might faint because that's what's supposed to happen. Arabella expects a medieval, perhaps ancient sort of courting, which include things no suitor in reality would do. Think of the uh, chivalric romances. We featured a few of them in our uh, last exhibit on love. As you can see, these volumes were read a lot to the point of falling apart. And in this slide, you can see the staining on the pages right here, if you can see the arrow on my computer around my thumb. And they were created exactly 
by use of my thumb. <laughs> my hands were clean, but the hundreds and hundreds of people who read these books before me left their mark. Um, so the staining happens from either dirt or from the natural oils in your hands, and it just darkens over time. Next up is Mary Mann and Elizabeth Peabody. They were the sisters of Savia Hawthorne, they were the Peabody sisters, if you're familiar with that book. Um, Sophia was later the wife of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Their parents had both been school teachers and education was highly valued in their home. They grew up here in Salem. Mary and Elizabeth were both teachers themselves with innovative approaches to education. Mary was also married to educated, educator reformer Horace Mann. Elizabeth ran her own school and brought the kindergarten concept to the United States. Um, this book is an important contribution to early childhood education and, of course, support, an important piece of our collection because of the local connection and the connection to the family. The stamped spine section on the left is the piece missing when we look at the next slide. Um, this is basically the only repair required, but as it is an important piece in our collection, um, it's worth mending for us. So there you see that piece missing. Now, The Life of General Francis Marion by Mason Locke Means, based on the memoirs of Colonel Peter Horry, who served with Marion. Marion was an American Revolutionary War general active in South Carolina. The British especially hated Marion and made, it re made repeated attempts to neutralize his force. Marion earned the nickname the Swamp Box because he eluded capture by British Colonel Tarleton for 26 miles through a swamp before Tarleton gave up. Marion was adept at guerrilla warfare and was a serious nuisance to the British in South Carolina and Georgia. The public memory of Marion has been shaped in large part by this first biography about him by Parson Weems. The New York Times has described Weems as one of the early hagiographers of American literature who elevated the swamp box, Francis Marion, into the American pantheon. Weems is known for having invented the apocryphal cherry tree anecdote about George Washington and Marion's life received similar embellishment. Supposedly, Horry felt that, who you know, his memoirs are based on, felt that Marion's achievements had been great enough and didn't require the over-the-top treatment given by Parson Weems. So this is a lovely little item with these woodcuts, but also read to the point of falling apart. And this one, Captain James knocking down Captain Andersoff with a chair, very dramatic scene. Next is Sketches of a Tour to the Lakes and by Thomas McKenney. So McKenney documented his travels to the Great Lakes where he took part in negotiations with the Ojibwe Native Americans. These negotiations were necessary so that he could form a treaty with the Chippewas and other surrounding tribes. The resulting treaty is known today as the Treaty of Fond du Lac. The text of the treaty is included as an appendix to this volume. Along his journey, McKenney learned a great deal about Ojibwe culture, as well as the native Ojibwe language. One of the things he observed and noted was children playing lacrosse. In this slide, the Chippewa vocabulary is on the right here, and the distances between the settlements and landmarks are noted on the left. McKenney includes illustrations of settlements, technologies such as snowshoes and dog sleds, portraits of Native Americans from several tribes and stations, and wildlife such as the swish in the lakes. The landmark depicted here is Castle Rock on Lake Superior. The engraving has the addition of a flag added by someone in pencil on the top right. Several of the engravings have been adulterated in a similar manner in this book. And it's a reminder that many hands have held these volumes over the years. The United States Secretary of War, James Barber, appointed McKinney to, deal on, to um, undertake the trip and the negotiations because he was the superintendent of Indian affairs. According to sketches of a tour to the lakes, McKinney is a firm supporter of negotiating with the Native Americans rather than eliminating them. McKinney served as superintendent of Indian affairs from 1816 until 1830 and was one of the very few government officials to defend Native American interests, which was in keeping with his religious beliefs as a Quaker. He commissioned portraits the visiting delegations and collected artifacts and information to record their rapidly changing ways of life. 
Later in 1830, he became a supporter of the Removal Act, which contradicted his original beliefs. President Andrew Jackson dismissed McKinney anyway when Jackson disagreed with McKinney's position that the Indian was in his quote, the Indian was and his intellectual and moral structure are equal. Both agreed that Indians should be civilized or move west of the Mississippi, but McKinney favored persuasion while Jackson preferred force. So he lost his job. Here we are, more miscellany, miscellaneous tracks, volume 11. In the 19th century, the Athenaeum bound pamphlets on similar topics together as a means of preserving them. Small formats and few pages mean that pamphlets are easily lost or mangled on the stacks. In the stacks. Um, this volume of pamphlets was compiled topically with records of the Peace Society of Massachusetts and early abolition pamphlets. Unfortunately, the vast differences in size was not a consideration, but has led to failure of the binding and warping of the contents. You can see the gap on the outside of the spine, especially on the right and a little bit on the left, and even more dramatically inside. So right here, so where the small ones start, that causes the gap on the outside. So the conservation plan will separate them and house them within one box to keep the materials together and represent volume 11 going forward. Seen here is the handwritten table of contents that was created when they were bound together. And we will keep that as part of its history. Volume 11 includes important abolition pamphlets by Anthony Benezet and John Woolman, two of the earliest American abolitionists. Benezet was from a French Huguenot family who joined the Quakers and emigrated to Philadelphia, where he met Woolman, who was already an avid abolitionist, lecturing and writing to convince other Quakers to join the cause. And in his business life, he refused to write wills to transfer ownership of enslaved people, rather advocating for manumission instead. These pamphlets are from the 1750s and 1760s, and obviously it took another century for abolition. But these pamphlets remained influential and laid the groundwork for later. Um, due to their advocacy, most Quakers had freed their slaves by the end of the American Revolution. And as you can see, this is the one by Woolman, and you can see the vast difference here around. Those pamphlets. Okay, Isaac Newton, Universal Arithmetic. First published in Latin in 1707 and then in English in 1720. This is the second edition, and it says right on the title page, very much correct. Uh, it was published in 1728. It's based on Newton's lecture notes at Cambridge when he was a professor, and it was published by his successor at Cambridge, William Whiston, but without his permission. And on the first Latin edition, his name does not appear at all. There are obvious condition issues. <laughs> um, the, the, the cover is off and the first page is totally loose. It covers algebraic notation, arithmetic, the relationship between geometry and algebra, illustrated here in this slide, and the solution of equations. Newton applied Descartes' rule of signs to imaginary roots. He also offered without proof a rule to determine the number of imaginary roots of polynomial equations. It took 150 years for a proof to be found, and it was in 1865 by James Joseph Sylvester. So this is part of his talk about destruction of roots. And William Nicholson, Introduction to Natural Philosophy, two volumes. Shown here is a discussion of astronomy with headings new stars on the left and changeable stars on the right. In this section is a wonderful illustration of a star map of constellations. You can see Gemini right there, and I'll leave it up so you can look for other constellations while I'm talking at you. Um, Nicholson was an English chemist and engineer. He is most known for discovering the electrolysis of water which has had many far reaching influences on research and industry. Nicholson invented a hydrometer for measuring the density of liquids in 1790 and improved the printing press by adding a cylinder covered in leather to rapidly ink the type. As a young man, he became acquainted with Josiah Wedgwood and served as his pottery agent in Amsterdam. 
And if you have heard our past presentations about books in the Athenaeum scientific collections, you may recall Josiah Edgewood, Edgewood was a nexus for participating in and supporting the scientific community in England in the 18th century. Wilson wrote Introduction to Natural Philosophy in 1781 and continued his scientific and engineering projects until his death in 1815. Nicholson gave lectures, wrote for the philosophical transactions, translated works of chemistry into English, and in 1797 founded and published the first independent scientific journal, the Journal of Natural Philosophy, Chemistry, and the Arts. He didn't leave anything out. Um, and it's commonly referred to as Nicholson's Journal. His excellent idea inspired many more journals, unsurprisingly. And um, the introduction to natural philosophy was one of his earlier works and was immediately successful. And you can see our copy is split right down the spine, um, makes it really easy to lay it flat and read it, but not so great for the structure of the book. And we're gonna fix that up. And this is one of the many, many pull out illustrations in this book, which is uh, the illustrations are wonderful. Um, and these are various types of pulleys. Thomas Jefferson owned a copy of this book and included it on a list of his recommended books that he created in 1809 and shared with others. The Athenaeum copy is the first American edition printed in Philadelphia in 1795. Our volume received a lot of use. As you saw, the spine was <laughs> in half. Um, and Denise, I'm done. So now I'll take any questions that you have. Um, I encourage you to sign up for Saturday to come and see these things in person. And um, of course, consider sponsoring SHARE to get these things prepared. Thanks. I'll stop sharing right now. I see there are some questions. Let's see. Um, Okay. So yeah, we have one from Bill about okay. um, the materials used for repairs in the past. Oh yes, okay. Did, did the previous repairs last as long as they should have or were they in some way of inferior quality? What's the expected lifetime of the new repairs planned for these books? Okay, so yes, they were of inferior quality because of the materials used. Often they used cheap leather that had not been you know, tanned properly, they got what they could get, basically, and probably the Athenaeum didn't want to pay the prices then that we're paying now to have them conserved. So the repairs that we have done now should last for several hundred years. So we will not remove the penciled in flag. That is part of the history of the book. <laughs> it's tempting to make it all clean and pristine. But uh, we have a very conservative approach to our conservation. Uh, we try to maintain as much of the actual history that you can learn from the physical object as possible. So any old book plates that are part of it, you know, the tears we fix, but if there's notes in the margin, we keep that. We only take off the surface dirt that can be removed. We don't scrub hard, et cetera, et cetera. So try to preserve it as much as possible. Anything else? Any comments? You can turn on your mic and ask at this point. Okay, how can we find out the, oh, uh, let's see, they're coming in now, wonderful. How can we find out the estimated cost of repairing each book? How can we sponsor a book this evening or should we wait till Saturday? Oh, so we have the list available online um, and Carolyn posted the link in the chat. So if you go to the chat, you can click right on it. Um, we opened it up before tonight. So some are already taken. Uh, will the conservation work be completed in our area? How long does it take once the funds are received? Okay, so we use two conservators. One is in Portland, Maine, and one is in Los Angeles. Um, she used to be local, but we kept her after she moved out there. Um, we have used others in the past. It depends on availability. Some of them have major projects that come in and they're booked for years. 
Um, so we kind of switch back and forth when we have to, but the two we use now have been with us since the beginning of the program and we rely on them. So I do send things to Los Angeles, um, to Maine. Sometimes we hand deliver, sometimes we ship. All good questions. Anybody else? I guess not. Well, thank you so much all for coming and for your good questions and for learning about our books. And um, I hope to see you on Saturday. And if you have any questions in the meantime, um, in the online signups. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Are there other issues of the Francis Bacon book around in any libraries? Have anybody owned them privately? How many are left of those? You said that they were published a few times. Yeah, so there were 10 editions. Oh, that's at it. Least, at least um, those were all in the first 40 years. So there's many, many copies of them. I'm not, I don't know how many of the exact one that we have. So he was in the 1500s. Was this Gutenberg Press? Or how no, did no, no. So he was, uh, I think it was 1626. Oh, 16. 1626. Yeah. So it was printed in London. Uh -huh. Well, so we're going to see these for real on Saturday? If on Saturday. So we're asking you to sign up for a half hour time slot so we can space everybody out. Well, that's right. And um, that's the sign up slots are available on the website as well. Okay, last call. Thanks everybody. See you on Saturday.